today we have Monica Fisher, Masters of Science, who's the Senior Market Manager Perimetry at Hogsweight Diagnostics and one of the authors of the Visual Field Digest, a guide to perimetry and, octo and the octopus perimeter, which is in its eighth edition. Monica is the octopus visual field expert at Hogsweight and is responsible for all market and uh, customer-oriented visual field activities globally. She is a Master of Science from the Swiss Federal Institute of Science and Technology and a Master of Advanced Studies in Marketing Management from the University of Basel. Prior to joining Hogstraight Diagnostics, Monica worked with the Trauma Product Management at Deploy Sins and the Dental Implant Product Management at Stroma. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Wayne, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to speak here in this more unusual format and unusual times. What I'd like to go through today is um, how you can back get the best from your octopus perimeters. And I want to go through a couple of common questions or common topics that always come up of things where we've really made an effort in the last 10 years to advance the device and the way you can analyze results. One of the key or questions I always get is which test parameters for which situation. So I'll start with that, but we can also look at how to get rid of fixation loss, tools to look at the diffuse loss and why they're useful, cluster and polar analysis for early borderline cases, and how you can really be faster and more effective for a progression analysis when you use the iSuite software. Let's jump right into it. Which test parameters for which situation? On the left-hand side, you can see a couple of things which theoretically could be changed, but practically nobody does, like similar, similar size or color or duration, background. I mean, there's some situations, but typically you can consider these as fixed. But then there's four things where you really, based on your patient's disease, um, you may make a different decision on how you test. So let's go through this. First one is what, what kind of parameters you use, static or kinetic? What kind of stimulus type, test locations, where should you test? And the strategy, which is really um, defining the stimulus brightness and the sequence of the brightnesses. So first question, static versus kinetic. Just as a review, static parameter is what we know best um, because that's the state of the art, especially for glaucoma, um, where we at a fixed location are looking, are kind of showing stimuli of different brightness and ask a patient to press a button if they see it. So, and then we define a threshold, this thing, and that gives us some kind of view like this. And that's a uh, grayscale. Um, here we have a typical hemianopia. Kinetic parametry gets a very similar result, but in a different way. So in, what kinetic does instead of changing the brightness, it actually changes the location, but keeps the brightness fixed. And because we see dimmer stimuli in the center than outside, we are able to draw these kind of isopters. And I, I always say this is like altitude lines on a physical map which kind of shows us the same result here. There's no vision, and here is fairly normal vision. So when to use what? And I know a couple of people answer the question, I always use static, because it is really the clinical gold standard, but why is that? Because it's really good to get really very precise thresholds. And that's something where we want to track very slow glaucoma progression. This is really helpful. And that's why it's one of the reasons why it's the standard for glaucoma testing. On the other hand, for glaucoma, we need to test just a small area, which we can do with the static sampling nicely. So that's where why this is really the gold standard. So glaucoma and macular disease is typically done uh, with static perimetry because it's fully automated. There's an argument that this is really great for visual ability testing, like driving tests with an estimate. Kinetic, on the other hand, gives us really high spatial resolution, fast peripheral testing, and gives us some information about other functions. And it's highly interactive and flexible for people who are not so good at doing it. So it's really good for a small change in, a facial, um, in spatial extent, like a papilledema, right blind spot is blind, but it's getting larger. It's good if we have to scan a large area or full field. It's really much faster. 
and in advanced disease, it's nice too because it's much easier for patients. So where is use neuroophthalmic conditions, peripheral retinal disease, low vision children, or any patient struggling with primary having cognitive impairment? Stimulus types. Um, the long-term standard is this classical Goldman size free stimulus. We have a couple of early detection stimuli on the Octopus 900 flicker or blue-yellow and the pulsar. They've been developed with the hope to really kind of be much earlier detecting glaucoma. But it seems like looking at 15, 20 years of research that is not always the case. So they're only used in special case situations. For low vision patients, the stimulus five is a nice option because it's much larger, easier to see. So really test, retest variability gets much lower, especially in a low vision area. Then questions where all people are always confronted with is, where should I test? You know, because it's virtually impossible to test the entire field. Like here we have a two degree spacing of the full field and we end up with nearly 5,000 targets. Even if we do a 10 degree spacing, we get almost 200 targets and no good resolution. So how do we do it? We really test in the area of interest only. And that's the kind of answer to, you know, what kind of test pattern should I use? You should always ask yourself, where is my area of interest? And then you compromise looking at that. For example, the cheap pattern for glaucoma uh, focuses on the 30 degrees because that's where you detect the disease. The M pattern for the macula focuses on the macula because macular diseases are natural in the macula. The estimate visual driving ability, you know, that looks like a, a car screen and there's nothing really from above or below because that's not where the hazards are coming from in driving. Ptosis, uh, a hanging lid, well, the lid's hanging down from above, so that's where we test. And with these compromises, we get much more accurate. So it's good to have a start. And for, for the octopus, it's really the G pattern, which has been optimized for glaucoma, but for a lot of other diseases too, because the points really follow the distribution of nerve fiber bundles. And so there are much more points in the center because there are much more nerve fiber bundles. There's clear nasal step you can see here. And it's less points temporarily because that's not where glaucoma is affected that much. You can see here five points in the fovea, 12 in the macula. And it's been some recent research really saying this compares much better than just rectangular grid like the 24-2 for paracentral defect, just because there are more points. The more points, you know, you have a much higher chance of detecting a defect. Here's a clear nasal step, and we also have clear separations of the hemisphere. So the G doesn't only stand for glaucoma, it also stands for general testing, because it's quite good also to detect any neurological disease. And here, just this comparison I talked about, like the commonly used 24 dash 2, which have been quite criticized in the last couple of years, but starting with work from Don Hood's group, that it really misses a lot of paracentral defects because it doesn't really test too much in the center. Um, there's a lot of pathology there that may be missed. I mean, the old study says 15% of glaucomatous defects are paracentral. So here is really, uh, if you have an octopus, the G is recommended to, uh, to go to, to start. And just the last question to decide what, you know, what test parameters should I use? Uh, is which intensities do I need to test? Uh, same problem like with the spatial extent, we can't test everything. We go with a very high precision, the test takes hours, days, and nobody's going to go through such a test. So we have to compromise again. And I don't want to go into details of the strategies, but the most commonly used ones are either the top or the dynamics. And both have their merits because it's always a trade-off between test time and precision. So from a purely mathematical point of view, the dynamic taking six to eight minutes is the more precise strategy, really much better at finding subtle very small isolated defects and the top, though for the majority of defects, it doesn't matter so much. The top, on the other hand, is much faster, so it has some workflow advantages, but there's some other advantages too, because it's fast, it's nicer for the patient, but it's also the way the strategy is done. Um, the top strategy starts really superficial. 
if you ever take one, it, it really starts very, very bright. And the dim ones that you barely see, they just come to the end of the test. And that's really nice, especially for patients learning or patients struggling, because it kind of makes it easy in the beginning, so they get a good feeling. And we know that psychology is everything for a reliable visual field result. So it's really just straight off mathematically, the dynamic is more precise, but top is better for people, for patients who really struggle. And that's why some studies say the one is more precise or the other. But it's really a choice. And then the last option are super threshold tests. When should they be used? I would just give us an answer of seen or not seen, or potentially also a relative defect um, of the two level test. This is one level test. It really makes sense when you're looking for an absolute defect, like ketosis, right? Everything on the left is, there's no vision. So why should you threshold at all? Or a blind spot, blind spot is blind, so why should you threshold? And sometimes this is also used for legal tests, like an estimate test, because we don't care in that question. The question is not how well does somebody see, but the question is, does somebody see a certain level to drive? So we just test there. And here that's from this book, The Visual Field Digest, there's really some recommendations where we see the majority of people choose these kind of things for the given indications. And if you have um, the latest iSuite version, uh, version 9 and above, here the software actually guides you through this process where it asks you, okay, what kind of indication do you need a test for? Okay, glaucoma, and then it just presents you the most common choices people make in the world. And give, it really gives you background explanations you can click through and it tells you what it is. So it should be fairly easy to make an informed decision on what to use. And obviously you set this up once and then you keep doing what you're doing. That was the first part. Uh, Wayne, um, are there any questions? Around or? No, actually nothing at this point. Nothing. Okay. Thank you. Good, then let's move on. How to get the best from your octopus parameter. Something that's really unique and really helpful is that you can get rid of fixation losses. Right, fixation losses of patients looking somewhere, typically because they don't see the stimulus and get worried that they're doing something wrong. What the octopus does is we track the pupil, you see a patient here, and the software notices if somebody, say, closes an eye or looks away and automatically pauses the test. And the moment the patient's fixating properly again, eyes open, it just restarts the test. So you may lose, you know, this patient's quickly looking away, going back to center, and it just keeps running. So really not losing a lot of time, but this is really helpful because you're not having any issues with fixation loss. People coming over from Humphrey parameter sometimes say, where's my gaze tracker? And I'll say, well, you don't need it because you don't have fixation loss. So what do you want to record? A kind of straight line? Just something to be aware of. Not all patients can properly fixate. For example, Parkinson's patients may have an unsteady pupil and, and the, mecha, um, the eye tracker may not get that. So there is an option to turn this down if you need to in your octopus. But if you don't, really let it run. It's, it's a great, great safety that you don't have to worry about that issue because each point is tested reliably. Good, then to move on, there is another problem associated with field testing and the solution that the octopus gives you. And that's the problem of diffuse loss. Let's just recap diffuse loss a little bit, uh, what it is. Diffuse or also widespread loss is what you can see on the top left. You know, the whole visual field is uniformly depressed, whereas of course a local defect is something localized at a specific location. And this tells us something about pathology. Basically, a lot of your most diseases in the anterior chamber, lens opacity, corneal opacity, dense vitreous opacity, gives us this kind of diffuse loss. But these diseases we would know of from our other diagnostic tests. So we don't do routinely visual field testing. That is more side effect, right? But here's where it's interesting when it comes to diffuse loss, because diffuse loss can also be the result of an untrustworthy 
we have patient not performing well, incorrect refraction, incorrect patient A, small pupil size, but all these psychological things too, learning effect, distraction, fixation loss, fatigue, they really all result in diffuse loss. And they often get called in in discussions, oh, my series, you know, why is this always jumping around? False positives and false negatives are down to zero. And yeah, they may be, but they don't catch everything. Diffuse loss is really another sign of an untrustworthy field. And it makes sense to be aware of it. Here, local defects is typically what we use visual field testing for a glaucoma, but also some neuro diseases very this is what we want to try to track. The others, the diffuse is more a confusion or an issue, either because of a second disease or because of an unreliable result. And just to be complete, of course, there's two untrustworthy field types associated with lens rim artifacts and lid artifacts. They also give us a local loss, but they have this very specific pattern. But this, I find a lot of people don't pay that much attention and then see the wrong thing. So it's, you know, kind of misinterpret a just non-reliable field as one with a pathology. And the way to go about it is I say, well, if you find diffuse loss, ask yourself, why is it there? Do you find any pathology going with it? If yes, okay, it's explainable, um, it happens. But if not, really take the visual field test with caution. So now, how can you really quickly assess that there's diffuse loss? And here's something uh, unique to the octopus, the defect curve, that really makes this quick and easy. I'll show you in this video how this, how it works or where it comes from and how to read it. You know, here we have our comparisons chart, total deviation chart, where all, we see all these different defects. And what we do is something mathematically super simple simple first grade, we just line up the numbers, the smallest on the left, the largest on the right. And then we draw this curve following the numbers. So it's nothing fancy from a math point of view, but it's really nice to read. So here's how a normal visual field looks like. Um, all this defect curve is in this normal band. And here is how a diffuse defect looks like. You get this parallel downward shift. Each point is depressed equally. Here's a local defect. And of course, you may have a combination of both, which then will give you both this parallel shift on the left and the drop on the right. And this is really nice and easy because you can't miss it. It takes you one, two seconds and you know, oh, diffuse loss, right? Either if it looks like this or if it looks like this, okay, there's some diffuse element here. Why is it here? And you have more information about the patient's social field. Okay. Then let's move on. We have actually, uh, can we just go back to this, uh, um, the fixation control? Sure. Um, Do you want me to go back to slides? No, no, there's just one oh, question just... came through on that. So I thought before okay. we get too far along here. In the fixation control, what level do you normally have it set at? Or do you uh, recommend? Medium, medium. That's also in the latest software version, the default. We used to have the default on this automated eye tracking on the Octopus 900, but we where where actually the Chinrest repositions you, but we get a lot of feedback. I mean, some people like it, but we also get a lot of feedback that patients are distracted by this. So, so now we we start with medium, and then we see how it goes. Okay, thank you. That was the only question for. Okay, then let's move on to some more recent tools uh, that come into the Octopus and the iSuite software, which are the polar and the cluster analysis, which are really, really nice tools for these early borderline glaucoma cases. What's the cluster analysis? Here just where it comes from. Um, the cluster analysis, again, starts with the comparisons chart, looks at the defects. But then what we do is, we make 10 retinal nerve fiber bundles based on the anatomy, and we take an average in these retinal nerve fiber band clusters. And that's what the cluster analysis does. And we use a probability thing, like we have in a probabilities representation, to figure out is there a statistically significant change or not. And in bold and in a new version, we have even red and orange. 
that means this is an abnormal cluster and the plus would mean this is a normal cluster. And let me explain to you why this is so cool. Why, I mean, so what? Why do you do that? Okay, another picture to look at, more work. It's actually really sensitive to detect glaucoma. It's more sensitive than looking at single points. Because right, we are kind of taught to look at the probabilities plot and then kind of search for cluster or free and something like that. Even if we do that, it's not, not as sensitive as the cluster analysis. Because you see, if you have a mild defect, something like this, the probability plot shows these mild potential defects, but it's only two. And, and the issue is that with single points, you have so much fluctuation, the normal ranges are huge. I mean, in the center is something like four decibel, just the normal range starts, stops at four decibel. But if we take an average, we get rid of a lot of the single point fluctuation and the normal boundaries get much smaller. And what happens is we actually detect a disease earlier and with certainty because the average is more robust and less influenced by fluctuation. But compared to an MD, which is also not good enough to detect early, very early glaucoma, which is a global average, this is really a local average. So that's nice. And here's just how we display it in the latest software version with color codes, orange is uh, potentially abnormal, red is highly likely abnormal. It's just two degrees of probability as we know from probabilities plot. And obviously, uh, I mean, if you suspect glaucoma, you're not sure, look at the cluster. This is really helpful. And if it shows something, you can be much more sure that this glaucoma, if it doesn't show anything, it's a contradiction. And I get later on, there's also a tr cluster trend analysis, which is really helpful too. Then, of course, today it's, we routinely take structural tests as well, and then we have to link them up. And for that, we have to develop the polar analysis. Uh, let me show you a video as well. So the polar analysis, what it does, it takes the local defects and projects them along the nerve fibers to the optic disc, because of course we know the anatomical relationship. And then it draws this polar plot, where really the length of these red bars represents the magnitude of the defect, and we flip it so that it's oriented exactly like a structural result. And then we can just look at the, the visual fields, Looking like, which looks like a structure, so next to a structure result. It's just again a view of this. Uh, so here's the visual field where we have a clear defect in the infratemporal side, and we would have to look for this on the fundus image or on the OCT. Here's just a practical example. Right, this is a visual field test and the polar analysis is still a visual field test, but it just oriented like a structural result. And it kind of tells you where should I go searching for a structural defect. And here clearly it's the infratemporal side. So we look for it here and we find the confirmation. It gives us much more confidence. And it's kind of a shortcut. Um, of course, you can do it and reorient things in your head, but it's just nice and easy. Here's just a couple of examples. So you see how this looks like a paracentral defect, early glaucoma, acute defect. Clearly the cluster analysis shows this is abnormal. The polar analysis shows that we have to look at the infratemporal side for the defect and we do find that in the OCT as well. So that's as well. So that gives us the confirmation. Okay, maybe before I move on to the progression side of things, which is a longer section, are there any questions on these uh, points? We've got two questions here. Sure. Uh, one of them goes back to the, to the reliability. And yeah. can a diffuse loss also indicate an unreliable field? Yes, that was, that was my whole point, why this is so relevant. Because a lot of these patient psychological effects, like destruction, fatigue, they all result in diffuse loss. And, and I really recommend you to kind of go three steps. First, is there diffuse loss? So you detect it using the defect curve. Second, why, ask yourself, why is it there? Is there another pathology causing it, like a cataract? If, you, if there's not, 
then that's for me quite a clear sign this is non reliable field. Okay, thank you. The second question actually said go back to the last uh, example and describe or show us the defect curve because. You, you had talked about the defect curve and just want to see that in the last example. The last one I showed? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. here we don't have a diffuse loss. We actually have a local loss, right? So local loss, so so the left-hand side, which is all this white, is just in the normal band, but then a couple of abnormal points here. So you get this drop on the right-hand side. And it's so this is not, this is the local loss. Um, but often, you know, you get things complicated with diffuse loss as well. Okay, good. That was okay. those were the questions we had. Thank you. Okay, then let's move on to our progression analysis. I don't know how many of you use it or have used it. So I'll start right from the beginning because I find a lot of people still like to look at zero results. And obviously that gives us a lot of information, but it's quite challenging to determine visual field ch change just lo looking at the series. Here's just some examples of glaucoma patients progressing or, you know, or not progressing. It's kind of sometimes hard to figure out. And, you know, we have all these kind of unreliability factors, bad day, worse, a better day, and that kind of thing. And so just jumping a bit around. So this is hard. And when we look at studies, they're actually quite discouraging saying our expert agreement on progression is something between 45 and 65 percent which is not that high and there's also some some unpublished data on the same doctor on two different days what kind of decisions do they make and they kind of disagree with themselves in 10 20 percent but what these studies also show that really a progression software increases the agreement and consistency of decisions and that's really helpful so let me walk through what the i -Suite software offers. It's just a lot. And it has the potential to really make you faster and also more consistent in your decision making. Here's just an overview, and I will go through that step by step. Because it looks quite overwhelming in the first place. So first of all, we still show the series because that gives us the information. So where's the defect? How deep is it? which of course is very important for your treatment, uh, to ask yourself how aggressive do I need to be. Then on the top left, we look at the mean defect change and ask yourself, is there a real change or just fluctuation? That's what this answers. And they also answers about the speed of change. And then going a step further, is this diffuse or local change? Um, I'll show you some examples later on why this is sometimes helpful. And then again, we do have a cluster trend analysis and we do have a polar trend analysis, which does the same thing, but just looks which cluster do progress and which don't. But let's start with the key question. Is there change at all or is it just fluctuation? And I'll build this up and introduce you to the trend analysis in case that's uh, still new. So what do we do? We take the mean average defect of each visual field. So this series is progressing, so the mean defect obviously is increasing as well. And, and the mean defect has actually shown to be really robust to change, uh, to, to detect progression. And then what we do is we do, we plot this against time. So we just take the test date and we put the, the defect in decibel, the average defect in decibel there. And then we do that for all consequence tests. And then what we do is we draw a so-called trend line. And think about, you're just getting, you see the square and you're getting the task. Well, draw a line that kind of fits nicely with these squares. And you can do it and you'll end up with something very similar to this. And this is the trend line. And interpretation is also easy. If it's kind of flat, it's stable. If it's going down, it's worsening. If it's going up, it's improving. Unfortunately, you know, things are not always so clear. So we use statistics, not just, you know, looking at things to determine a trend line, but that's what it is. And, and then what we can do when the trend line is nice and we call this slope, you know, it's sloping downward. We, we get a chance to measure rate of change over time. You know, we, we take, we start at the beginning of a year, we go to the end of a year and we just see, look at how much has the, 
the, defect, the mean defect dropped in this one year. Okay, 1.9 decibel. So that means our slope is 1.9 decibel a year, or rate of change is 1.9 decibel per year. So we have 1.9 decibel worsening. And that, of course, allows you to think about your treatment um, or the aggressiveness of your treatment in relation to patient age. And let me just get to some of the challenges of the progression analysis and to explain you some of the basics. I'll really help you with the interpretation. The question about real change or just fluctuation, as I said in the beginning, we can do this kind of manually. But the issue is if we have a lot of fluctuation like here, you know, why do we think this is not, the, you know, this is not real or why do we think this is real? And these are the outliers. We don't really know. So, so we use statistics to determine that. And what happens is that it, sometimes when the more reliable results is this, the slowlier change we can detect easily. You see here, even though the trend line ends up with a faster progression because of all these outliers, we actually don't really think that we're not yet sure whether this is really progressing. The way we show that things are progressing is with a down, red downward arrow. So the software, if the software, like you see this trend line, but there's nothing here, the software still says, well, I can't be 100% sure that this is progressing. You still have to assume this is stable. If you get this, then the software really tells you, I think this is progressing. Um, it's quite likely to progress. So interpretation becomes really quick and easy because you just need to look for these symbols. And there are two degrees. So we have red down wherever that's worsening. Sometimes there is improvement in some cases. If you have no symbol, you can consider that stable. And then you have two degrees uh, of how likely is it to worsen. So the fill one is more likely to worsen. But if, really, if you see if you see a red downward arrow, and that's just what you have to look for, okay, I think this is changing. This is worth the name. So this becomes very quick. Uh, you just look at this. Do you see a red symbol? Yes, okay, worsening. How fast is it? You look at the slope and you know a lot. And that takes you two seconds, three seconds. That's really nice and easy. Let's move on just with a couple of complications or some things that will help you. I, I have one question here. Say, uh, just reading it, it says, basic question. I have a patient with six or seven fields, but I cannot get any trend data. How do yeah. I see the trend data? I'm just getting to that. I mean, what do you mean? You, you okay. don't, you don't, I mean, you mean in the software, you don't see trend da data at all? Yeah. Is, is, okay, it's a practical question. There may be two reasons. One, you, for whatever reason, accidentally unselected the field, so they're not selected. But more likely, you you may have done chosen different past test patterns for, for the test. You can't, the trend analysis only works for the same pattern. So you need to have six, you need to have at least three of the same type. So three G or three M or three 24-2 or whatever, because you know, because we have data, we take an average over a different area, so that's not comparable. So you need to stick to the same pattern if you do progression analysis. It's, so the response here was that all six are Gs. Okay, then I think send send an email to Innova and deposit on yeah. to me and have a look at it. It's Maybe actually, we can if, if if you push it through to the the support team for the perimeter is support at anovamed.com. If you send it to them, they should be able to resolve it. And if there's a, still a problem, we'll push it on to Monica and she right. can help us uh, solve that. Yes. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back uh, to that, to the talk. So here is uh, something I want to show you about why it makes sense to really spend an effort in doing virtual field testing well, train your technician well. Because you know, if you if you have something like this with a lot of outliers, um, a lot of fluctuation, six tests may not show you a trend, even though you would suspect a trend here. Um, but the statistics just can't just tells you, well, we still cannot be sure. This you know, this may be unreal, but we don't know what's unreal. I mean, it may be much more worsening. And then and what you can see here is if you have an unreliable patient, you actually need more data and then suddenly a trend shows. 
And that's really important, you know, when we get this, this recommendation on let's do six visual fields in the first two years of testing the patient. This comes from that, that if we have a lot of fluctuation, we need more data, and then we can actually find progression. Six sometimes isn't even enough, depending on how patient flux plays. So it really makes sense if you're not sure, test more, but also make an effort to train your technicians, so give them the time to support the patient doing the test. It really boosts your reliability and helps you with finding progression earlier and be more confident. And that's just another example showing you this, right? Here is a relatively fast change with 0.9 decibel a year, but there's quite a bit of fluctuation, some outliers, so the software doesn't find a change. Whereas, and I've shown you this example before here, even though this is a relatively slow change because the patient's very consistent, you can still detect it. So I like to repeat it again because I don't always see that work for you in practice for practical reason. It's really about a technician helping a patient along, instructing them. A patient who doesn't understand what they need to do, they will not perform well in a test. And also monitor them, especially the ones who struggle. Maybe give them a break, re-instruct them, that kind of thing. It really, it really, really boosts your reliability. My take is by something like 30%. Not all patients are reliable, you always find an unreliable one. But you can get something, the best I see is something like 95% reliable patients. Obviously it depends on the type of patients you see. And the last one, be really careful about, don't put unreliable, untrustworthy fields into your trend analysis it's got, because you're really gonna kind of destroy your result. Here's a very extreme but real example of a patient having a toast lid artifact in the first test, having very high false positive rest in the rates in these two tests, and that's why they perform so much better. And when you end up using trend analysis, you actually see this green arrow going up. This is improving. But is it? Really? Let's think about it. Let's take, get rid of the tosis because that's just the lid hanging down. And maybe later on they taped it up. And this changes the trend analysis, and suddenly we have a stable series. But actually, we see things going down. So what about this? Oh, wait, they're unreliable, right? Very high false positives rate. So we take them out as well, and suddenly we find progression, very clear progression, that we may have missed otherwise. This is something where the iSuite software is also really nice. You see here, nothing selected right now. And you can just go and click in your software and select it. It's nothing you need to do on a machine or anything. And that's one of the reasons why I highly recommend, if your practice allows it, to connect your iSuite, you know, install it on your office computer, connect it to the machine and look at the results in the office, because then you can interactively play with the data. If you just print them, that gets much harder. So we've gone through this already. Good. It's an update, an update yep. from a doctor that was having a problem with the trend. He figured it out. It was it was how he was clicking on the on the exams okay. so that the, they would be turned on. So that was it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's sometimes a bit tricky. Um, okay. Great. We solved that. So then the key question, of course, is their progression. But there's some other interesting things. Cases, for example, a question is the change local or diffuse. Here's just again the repetition, the, the diffuse one can either be some anterior chamber disease, most common of course is cataract, or it can be the result of an untrustworthy field. And when is, is this useful to know whether you have local or diffuse change? Most common, if you have overlapping diseases, most common combination is a cataract and glaucoma. And then you have something like this, and this is still fairly clear. Uh, but you may have slowlier progression and you may not see it, right? Because if the cataract is progressing, not operated, you may not see the glaucoma progressing. Or you, you just don't know, right? I mean, this clearly is progressing, but why? And the other question we also have is, and, that, and that's quite common too, we have a lot, sometimes patients have a bad day and they get, and I said, um, diffuse loss can be a sign of an unreliable field. This may have been one of these ways, but of, of course, this kind of changes 
resolvent glaucoma progression is subtle. So is glaucoma progressing or not? It gets difficult with these kind of things, I know. So what we do now, and this is all based on the defect curve, I don't want to go too much into maths, but we take basically the whole field apart and say this is a diffuse component called DD, diffuse defect, or LD, local defect, and then we track those. And we use the exact same trend analysis that we used before, the exact same symbols, but we just look at DD, diffuse trend, progression, LD, local progression. And it becomes very simple, right? So is this changing? Yes, it is. Which speed? 1.5 decibel a year. Okay. Why is the change? Is it diffuse? Yes, it is. So the cataract is, is, changing, is progressing. Is it local? Yes, it is. So glaucoma is progressing too. And we have a whole answer. The fourth thing we display is the SLV, which we mainly do for historic reasons. I find it's not so helpful when you have both diffuse and local loss because it depends on which one is larger and progressing faster and how what this shows. But some people are really used to that, so we still show this. Then the other example, patient with subtle glaucoma, but also some fluctuation. And here the trend analysis doesn't pick it up, mostly because um, there's so much fluctuation here. And now it's the nice thing. If I can look at the diffuse trend, you know, this is exactly the same pattern. So this whole fluctuation, the MD is jumping around that much because of this diffuse component, better and worse days. But now we look at the LD, the local progression, and we really see a significant change. So this is useful too. Sometimes the diffuse component may mask a small local change. And then just before we close, where does the change happen? That's, of course, also a very important question. So we have the same cluster analysis we also have as a cluster trend analysis. And then we just look at these cluster mean defects and how they change over time. This is the speed per year. But more important, again, the same red symbols going down. OK, these clusters here all show a significant change. So it's really, I find it's very easy to understand very easy to grasp. And the nice thing about it, like the cluster analysis, this is a bit more sensitive to detect glaucoma progression just, than just the MD trend analysis because it's not just a global thing. It really is local and glaucoma typically progresses local or starts locally. But on the other hand, it's also more sensitive to just pointwise analysis like you have in the size GPA pointwise analysis because single points are just influenced by so much fluctuation that it needs quite a big change to really pick something up. So this is really the nice, kind of you get the best of both worlds. And that's why you detect glaucoma a bit, glaucoma just change a bit earlier. And it also tells you where the progression is. Obviously, if it's in the center, there's much more to worry about. You see, I mean, you, you sometimes get cases like this, and there's a lot of fluctuation. We see this on the de diffuse defect, and it's only the local progression that picks up a serious trend. But now where's the progression? And it kind of gets hard. And here the cluster analysis is again helpful. I really say, well, statistically, I think it's here. Another example where this is also really better than an MD is in advanced disease, where a large part of the visual field is gone, which means then, of course, it's not progressing anymore. It's kind of stable, and that masks the progression of the rest of the field, right? I mean, we're not that interested in the superior half of the field. We're interested in the inferior half. And here is where the cluster trend analysis really picks up this change, whereas the global trend analysis wouldn't. And it clearly also says, well, here in these clusters, there's a floor effect, so don't worry about these anymore. I mean, so that's where this really, really adds value. And then corresponding to the polar analysis, we have the polar trend analysis, which with red bars just show, hey, here, um, I've seen a worsening in the series I look at. And again, it answers the question, where should I look for structural results? You have a progress, clearly progressing case here on the nasal side, I'm going to a partial arcuate defect, 
um, clearly progressing, it's clearly locally. Russian is, as we can of course see, the superior part. And the polar the polar trend analysis now says, okay, check for structural progression here, uh, super temporally and infratemporally. And that's where we find it in the change over the years. So this is also a very helpful tool. So let's just finish this session with two more cases. And then I'm happy to take more questions. So let's take this case, seven years. Uh, these are very clean cases for educational purposes. I mean, here we quite clearly see there is a progression. But of course, the, the mean defect shows clear progression, but slow at only 0 0.4 decibel a year. The progression is local, even though there's some diffuse element here, you know what you can actually see here? Something is a little bit improving, at least it appears like this, even though it's statistically not relevant. This could be a learning effect. Patient, you know, this is unreliable diffuse component, it gets a bit better over time. And you see here, cluster analysis, where the change happens. The polar now, the polar trend analysis shows you where to look for structural change. And that's what you'll find here in these fundus pictures too. Another case, again, very clear progression. Mean defect, uh, yes, significant change because we had this red arrow down. The rate of change is one decibel per year. Uh, it's local. Where is it? It's uh, superior and paracentral. And that's where we have to look for structural change, and that's where we find it to, in the OCT. So just one more time, a bit systematic. The series really helps you to get a feel for the, just the absolute location and depth, which of course you need for your clinical decision making. Whereas all the progression analysis tells you about change and probability of change. So the MDs are just answers, is there overall change or just fluctuation? And the DD and the LD progression tell you, well, is that diffuse or local change? And then when you want to look at where it happens, uh, well, is there cluster change? In which clusters? And where should I look for structural change with the polar trend analysis? So I hope you found some of this helpful for your clinical practice, and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, I've got a few questions here. First one is, on the polar analysis, what are the gray circles in the center? Do you mean the polar trend or just the polar analysis? Oh, the polar analysis that says here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let me just go back to this. Okay, well, so this yeah. is, is a rough, the, the gray circles is a rough um, estimate of normal range. Because this, you know, this is a oh. point-wise analysis, so there is a certain normal range where you shouldn't overinterpret things. Okay, thank you. Next question was a related question to the topic is technician education. Is it possible yeah. to have a dedicated webinar on technician uh, training? I, I can answer for, I'm not positive this is somebody from Canada, but if you're from Canada, we can uh, do a dedicated webinar with our support team in, in Toronto just send an email to support at anovamed.com or go to our website at anovamed.com and um, go to the education, the, the academy page. There's a webinar on demand section where you can schedule a time to work with one of our support people and they can go over um, with the technician uh, what's the best practice to get good information. Um, I'll, I'll find out if if, because we have a number of people from outside of Canada here, if it's from outside of Canada, we'll deal with that a little bit differently. Correct? Yeah. Monica, yeah. is there anything else happening? Okay. Yeah, if you're from um, outside then, of Canada, I contact your local Huxtrite distributor. Um, they will help you. Okay. And then the last question I have here is, I heard that there's a new software version. Is this accurate and how can I get it? Yes. I guess I answered that as well. Yes. <laughs> you go ahead and answer it and I'll tell you how to get it. <laughs> yes. So there is, um, I think two or two and a half years ago, we launched a 
completely reworked version where we really worked a lot on making things more intuitive, giving you a lot of kind of pop-ups of tips and tricks or explanations, kind of running the testing as a workflow so that even technicians with nearly zero training can operate the device. Not that I recommend that, but really making things a lot easier. And now, Wayne, you can say how you can get that. If we go back to the answer I gave, well, somewhat earlier, is if you have any, if you'd like to check your version of software, make sure that you have the current version. And since the release, um, initial release of the current version, there's been a whole bunch of different iterations. So even if you think you're at the most recent, it's not a bad idea uh, to reach out and confirm you've got the most recent version. And you can do that by sending an email to support at anovamed.com and uh, you can advise them what version you have that would come up on the, I don't have the software in front of me, but there's a about, I think, on the, um, in the things at the top, the links at the top. And you can figure it, you see your version. Monica can catch me on that. And just send through the version number and our support team will confirm that that's the most recent one. And if not, we'll schedule a time to help you get the most recent version installed in your system. I've got another question here. Does that, was that a fair response, Marta? Is there anything else? No, I think that's a fair response. And for international participants, again, contact your local Hoxtrad distributor and they will help you. Okay. Actually, and so I heard some suggestions about pausing the exam. But will many pauses distract the patient? Should we, in some cases, avoid readjusting or talking to the patient? So you mean like when, when the technician interacts too much with the patient, is that the question? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. I mean, not every patient can do visual fields reliably. I would keep this, like what I, what I do is I would, obviously I instruct before I start a test and I have, have a conversation there. And then what I do is I, I really monitor the first five to 10 stimulus very, very carefully. Don't walk out of the room at that moment. And if somebody doesn't press a button for three or four, still in the beginning, I know there's something wrong and I, I even stop and re-instruct. And then it's just up to monitor, you know, like, I mean, if there's something really wrong with the patient doing the test, I, I try to catch it very in the very beginning and, you know, help the patient along before we all the way down and the test need to stop all the time, because I agree that's distracting. Other than that, yeah, I mean, I said, I think the first half a minute, 15 seconds, half a minute are really critical. I, I know there's some setups where it's not possible to have a technician all the time in the room for monitoring, but at least, you know, the first 30 seconds, get the test started well. I think that's very important. And then what okay. I find, yeah, it's just some patients can't do it that well, whatever you do. Okay, thank you. There's a suggestion here of uh, developing a tip, tip of the week email um, to, to, to keep people sort of front of mind how to use their octopus the best possible. So I just throw that out for you. Um, and I think that's the end of the questions. If anyone has another question, please put it through right now. Oh, it looks pretty, pretty good. Thank you very much for your time, Monica. That was great. I, every time I learn a little bit more. I appreciate your effort, and as does I think everyone here. Much have a thank great day, everyone. Well, thank you very much as well for listening in, and have a great day.